Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all-mailbag installment here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad you decided to join us on this Sunday. Hey, listen, I want to let you know in advance here, we do take all your mailbag questions here on Saturdays and Sundays. We also take a couple mailbag questions on AMC Movie Talk Monday through Friday. And if you want to get your question into us, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You can see the email address right below me there. Send on in your email, and who knows, maybe your question will get answered on Movie Talk or Mailbag, and we look forward to uh, getting your email. So, it's been an interesting weekend. Um, <clears throat> I've had a lot of stuff going on, still kind of fighting my cough, so forgive me when I'm, I'm, I've got a lozenge in my mouth all the time to prevent me from coughing too much, but I've had a really good weekend so far. I hope you have too. So let's finish off this weekend by getting to some mailbag questions, and we're going to start this uh, Sunday's mailbag with question number one. And question number one comes to us from Nathan Swaza, who writes, Hey, AMC Movie Talk, I love the show and get up every morning to watch it. Well, thanks a lot, Nathan. We appreciate it. My question is, did you like The Hobbit in 48 frames per second? And what do you think of the rumors saying Star Wars Episode 7 will be done in 48 frames per second? Personally, I think it's an awful idea, and the 48 takes you out of the movie. Thank you. And bring on the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Nathan. And <clears throat> for those of you who may not know what Nathan's talking about, um, for traditionally speaking, for as long as we can all remember, film movies shoot in 24 frames per second. Now, what that means is for every one second of footage you see on a movie screen, what you're actually seeing is 24 individual frames that go by in one second. So creating the illusion of motion. And for the longest time, the film industry standard has been 24 frames per second. That's always been the standard. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that was kind of adopted as the standard because that was like the minimum amount of frames per second you could do while still making it look smooth and fluid. And so forever, that has been the standard. Now, technology has changed and what have you. And people started experimenting with different frame rates. I mean, you can get a lot of consumer-grade video cameras now that'll shoot like 60 frames per second or whatever. But Peter Jackson comes along, and he's doing The Hobbit, and he decides he's going to, you know, break with tradition. Uh, and, and he's not the very first person to do it, but it's the first big major Hollywood film to do it. And that he was going to shoot The Hobbit in 48 frames per second, essentially giving us double the amount of images in that one second um, that we see and that our eyes perceive to give us the illusion of motion. So, I mean, and technically speaking, 48 more frames per second is better, technically speaking. Uh, it gives you, you know, the more images crowned in there. It's like, it's like the amount of pixels per inch you see on your screen. You know, if you have, um, you know, 1020 or, or HD, that's more pixels packed into the same amount of space, you get a crisper, richer image than, say, if you had, you know, 480 dimension. Uh, with the amount of pixels that brings in the same amount of space. So technically speaking, in, you know, in a way, you think about it, in that one second, now they're packing double the amount of images. So in theory, you get a clearer, smoother, and that's one of the key things, a smoother uh, kind of motion because you have more information per second being transmitted from the screen to our eyes that our brains then interpretate. So Peter Jackson comes out and does 48 frames per second. And the division immediately amongst fans was noticeable. Some fans absolutely loved the 48 frames per second. They thought it just brought a new dimension. This is the next step in film technology uh, and that soon everybody will be shooting in 48 frames per second. However, not everybody felt that way. And I have to admit, as much as I love The Hobbit, <clears throat> and I saw it like four times, I think, in theater. I think it was four times. And the first time I saw it, I saw it in 48 frames per second. And my next three times, I avoided 48 frames per second. I, I mean, to me, and remember, this is just to me. And this is just my personal taste and my personal experience with it, okay? To me, it looked like a soap opera. Um, it looked like video uh, on television of a really HD clear local soap opera being shot. I mean, it didn't feel like a movie to me. And when I make that argument to some people, they'll come back to me, and, and understandably so, they'll come back to me and say, yeah, but John, you got to take into consideration, you only feel that way because you're used to seeing 24 frames per second. That's what you're used to. 
and now being introduced to something what they say is better, um, it's just going to take you a little while to adjust to what is better, and then pretty soon that will become your standard. And that is a perfectly logical, um, perfectly logical argument to make, because they they have something there. I say it doesn't look like a movie to me, and they can counter back to me and say, "Well, John, that's just because what looks like a movie to you is you know you've grown up with as a standard your whole life, and so now introdu- being introduced to something new, that's what's throwing you off. It's not that there's anything wrong or inherently wrong with 48 frames per second." And I'm not going to discount that, and I'm not going to just throw that argument aside and say that's ridiculous. They, they probably have a point, but it's still a legitimate gripe I have because, okay, maybe that's the case, but to me, 24 frames per second is what a movie is. That look that 24 frames per second gives us, for me personally, and not everybody feels this way, and that's cool, but the look that 48 frames per second gives to me feels cheap, even though it's technologically far more advanced. But to my eyes, it makes the movie feel cheap. And I got to admit, it pulled me out of the movie um, quite a bit, as a matter of fact. So I, I saw, you know, The Hobbit 40 frames per second, and I was like, okay, I, I don't want to see this in 48 frames per second again. It doesn't, it just doesn't feel like a movie to me. And you know, our experiences are often outside of our choice. We don't choose to like something or not like it. Like when you take a, you're in a restaurant and you take a, the first bite of your meal, your taste buds and your brain and everything are going to react and you're going to either like it or not like it. You don't actually choose whether you like it or not like it. You can choose to say whether you like it or not like it, but when that food hits your taste buds, you're going to have a reaction and it can be either positive, neutral, or negative. And it's kind of outside of your control. It's much like a joke, right? Like you don't actually choose to find whether you find a joke funny or not. Somebody tells a joke and you either kind of giggle or you don't. I mean, you can choose to fake it if you want. But normally speaking, you're, you, know, you don't choose how you react to something. You just, your body just does. And then you express what it was your reaction was. And I, I find that 48 frames per second is kind of one of those things to me. It's not one of those things you choose to like or dislike. It's one of those things that... It happens, you watch it and experience it, and then, you know, how you liked it or not is something you you discover as you're watching it. And just for me personally, the 40 frames per second didn't work. I have heard the rumors about Star Wars maybe shooting in 48 frames per second. I don't think there's much validity to that. Um, JJ has never shot 48 frames per second. I don't think... Uh, as a matter of fact, J.J. is one of these guys who really likes shooting on film when he has the ch- chance and the choice. Um, and I don't think, especially considering this is the first new Star Wars film since the the dreaded prequels, I don't know that he would want to roll the dice on a technology that he's never used before in a movie that absolutely must be knocked out of the park, which is Star Wars Episode Seven. So... I've heard the rumors. It's absolutely possible that they may do it. It is absolutely possible. That being said, them knowing that the audience has been kind of split on 48 frames per second, that a lot of people don't like 48 frames per second, and that J.J. has never shot in 48 frames per second, I have a feeling that Star Wars Episode Seven probably isn't the movie that they're going to want to take a chance on and try and you know, experiment Uh, with 48 frames. So I don't think it's going to happen. That's just me. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section. And by the way, I would love to know your thoughts too, just in general, of the 48 frames per second technology. Let me know if you saw The Hobbit in theater. Forget on your TV screen. If you saw The Hobbit in theater in 48 frames per second, and I'd be really curious to know about what your action. Did you hate it? Did you love it? Uh, Did you not notice it? Uh, Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Abdo Esper, who writes... Hey guys, greetings from Mexico. Well, hello, Abdo. Thank you for writing. Uh, It's so weird that I don't even know you guys, and yet you've become a part of my life. Well, thank you so much, man. We appreciate that. Anyway, sometimes when a movie comes out, it is met with mixed or negative reviews. It is only within the passing of time that people really begin noticing how really good it is, just like Citizen Kane or Singing in the Rain. Do you think the Oscars should give awards to movies 10 years after they've come out? Uh, in that way, you can hand the Oscar to movies that really stand the test of time 
and prevent any more mistakes from being made. Um, well, you know what? I'm going to tell you something, uh, Abdo. When I first read your question, my first reaction was, oh, that's silly. My first reaction, oh, is that that's just a knee-jerk fan reaction. But, but honestly, the more I think about it, I think you're onto something. Look, I've always been a fan of the honorary Oscar that they give out. They give out one or two every year. And the reason I really value, some people see that as a, as a cop-out Oscar. I don't. I see that as maybe even a more prestigious award than winning a, a regular Best Actor of the Year award at a regular Oscars. Because that is the entire, when you get one of those Lifetime Achievement Awards, or Career Recognition Award, I call it sometimes, what that is kind of essentially saying, that is the industry as a whole saying, we as a collective body sit back and look at the, the body of your work over your career and what you have done in this career. And we think it is worthy of, you know, the hall of honor recognition. And we want to recognize that by bestowing this upon you, if you for your collective body of work. And I've always been a big fan of that for individuals. I, I think it's always been great because it means that, you know, I talk all the time about how the Academy Awards are, are the, tr the trickiest, most difficult award to win because not only do you have to be amazing that year, but out of the 800 other lead actors in films that year, you've got to hope that nobody, even though you were amazing, you got to hope somebody else wasn't just a little bit better. And that's completely outside of your control. I think that's, you know, that's what's happened with Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, there, there's lots of times that Leonardo has deserved to win an Oscar, but the fact of the matter is, every year that he's been nominated, there was somebody who, unfortunately for Leo, came out and was just a little bit better that year. And so he doesn't have an Oscar. And so I've always loved the idea of the honorary Oscar to recognize and, and to correct those mistakes and to recognize the grand body of work when somebody just delivers consistent excellence upon excellence upon excellence. Because I'll be t honest with you. Um, I think I would take um, I would take um, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio over Nick Cage, and 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 believe me, I am a Nick Cage fan. I'm a Nicolas Cage fan. Nicolas Cage has an Oscar on his mantle because he was really great that one year in that one film. Actually, he's been great in a lot of films, but he's got an Oscar on his mantle. Leonardo DiCaprio doesn't, and if Leo DiCaprio goes, you know, the rest of his career getting like six more nominations but never quite winning, then I think it's great that the Academy says, you know what, you know, we'll take your body of work because you year in, year out, movie in, movie out have delivered excellence in your performances and we want to bestow this upon you. I think there's huge value in that. So if I see that there's huge value in that, why not for movies as opposed to individuals? Why not? Because you're right, Abdul, I think there are some movies that you need a little bit of passing of time. I think there are some movies that come out that you just recognize their genius and their brilliance immediately. There are those films. But I also think you're right. I think there are a lot of films out there that come out that need a little bit of passage of time for people to really understand maybe how far ahead of its time it was or really how deep it was or really how brilliant it is and, and how well it would stand the test of time. Um, so, for example... If you were to do, <clears throat> I don't think you do it 10 years later, but if you were to do that today, I mean, one of the first films I would give uh, is say, uh, this movie deserves to be in the Hall of Honor, um, Shawshank Redemption. Think about this. Shawshank Redemption, more times than not, will appear on most critics' 10 best films ever made or 15 best films ever made or something like that. It's, I know Shawshank Redemption is in my top 10. Um, it is one of the greatest films I think ever made. Just, it's just so breathtakingly awesome. But it didn't win Best Picture that year. Um, it ran into a movie that got hot and rode a wave of momentum and it captured the Oscar and that was Forrest Gump. And I believe if you redid those Academy Awards from that year, I believe Shawshank, I, I don't believe there'd be many votes that, sh that wouldn't go to Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank Redemption has proved over the test of time it is the better film over Forrest Gump. I'm not trashing Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump is a great film. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trashing it in the least. I'm simply saying that Shawshank Redemption is one of the greatest motion pictures ever made. 
So I would be completely all for that. Um, Star Wars didn't win best picture, best picture, and it is one of the without argument whether you love Star Wars or hate it. And I know there are some of those freaks of you out there who don't love Star Wars. Um, but love Star Wars or hate it, what you can't deny, it is absolutely one of the single most influential films ever made. Ever. It kind of changed the course of film history. It became a major influence on filmmakers you know, from that era on. And you know, it kind of introduced us to the blockbuster in many ways, and the phenomena that a movie could be, that, that Star Wars was. It didn't win Best Picture. I'm not completely convinced that it deserved to win Best Picture that year, but it didn't win Best Picture, and at some point, you probably got to go, you know what, we need to instill into this Hall of Honor, this Hall of Fame, this, this, this conclave of legends, the movie Star Wars. Um, I got to tell you, man, even though I guffawed at your, your idea at first... The more I think about it, the more I think it's a great idea. I would be all for once a year bestowing that, I, you didn't call it an honorary Oscar, maybe an Oscar of honor, upon a film that has stood the test of time that maybe wasn't recognized for the fullness of its brilliance when it first came out, but has garnered the audience and the respect of critics and fans and the industry alike over years. It stood the test of time. And it deserves to be honored. I gotta tell you, I love the idea, and I hope uh, I hope the Oscar producers are watching this show. They're not, but I hope they are, and that they take this idea to the table. Great idea, man! All right, let's move on to the next question for the day. And the next question today comes to us from Barnadurl, <laughs> uh, Barinderpal, uh, now Nanunin. Forgive me if I'm butchering your name, man. I'm trying my best. Um, Barinder Pal Nanunin writes, Hey guys, love your show. Thank you so much. Did anyone notice that Finding Dory, that's the sequel to Finding Nemo, by the way, and How to Train Your Dragon 3 are coming out on the same day, July 17th, 2016? I'm pretty sure that one of them is going to end up changing dates, and I believe it's going to be How to Train Your Dragon 3. Do you guys think that one of them will change the date, and which one? Keep up the good work. Um, I'll be honest with you, man. <clears throat> I totally missed it. I totally missed the fact that Finding Dory and How to Train Your Dragon 3 are scheduled to come out on the same day. What we've got here is suddenly another Batman vs. Superman vs. Captain America 3. Now, now Batman vs. Superman has just moved into March, uh, so that's no longer a problem. But we've got now suddenly we've got another standoff. We've got another game of high-stakes chicken playing out before our eyes. We got Disney is putting out um, Finding Dory, the highly anticipated sequel to, to Finding Nemo. And, of course, you've got, um, I, believe it's, I believe it's DreamWorks, is putting out How to Train Your Dragon 3, what is, which has become an excellent franchise. Excellent franchise. I mean, I was really shocked, <coughs> pardon me, myself, about how much I liked. Well, first of all, I was really surprised how much I liked the first How to Train Your Dragon. I wasn't expecting the first How to Train Your Dragon to be so good, and I loved it. And then How to Train Your Dragon 2 was coming out, and it kind of crawled into theaters. You know, there wasn't a lot of excitement surrounding How to Train Your Dragon 2. There wasn't a lot of hoopla. There wasn't a lot of high anticipation. And part of the reason was probably the fact that the marketing wasn't great. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. And I just don't know that the movie looked all that fantastic. And then to my surprise, I think I might have liked it even more than I liked the first How to Train Your Dragon. How to Train Your Dragon 2 is a great film. It's really, really good. I enjoyed it a great deal. So you got two powerhouse films that are going to be, op they're technically speaking, opening on the same day. Look, much like Batman vs. Superman, Captain America 3, and I said, look, this is not going to happen. They are not going to open on the same day. At some point, somebody's going to move, and it's probably going to be DC. Warner Brothers will probably, or yeah, Warner Brothers and DC will probably move Batman versus Superman. And they did, and it was a good move. It was a very smart move on Warner Brothers' part. So now we got this other one, and I'm going to tell you right now, they will not open on the same day. You are not. I'm, I'm going to tell you, July 2016 is not going to come around and have Finding Dory and How to Train Your Dragon 3 opening on the same day. There, there are two movies that are absolutely going after the same demographic. 
um, kids as well as families, stuff like that, <clears throat> they're not going to do it. It's, it's mutually assured destruction. Because even though they'll both do well, and Finding Dory would probably win the box office that weekend, but they're both going to suffer for it. Both of those films will not do as well than what they would do if they opened on dates separate from each other. So at some point, a clearer head will prevail. And what's probably going to happen is you're probably getting phone calls right now happening between DreamWorks and Disney and some negotiating and some jostling and saying, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll make sure we stay off this date in the future if you'll move off this this July 17th, 2016 date, blah, blah, blah. They're trying to figure out how many weeks away it should move because this is... This is one of those things where I don't think you can just move How to Train Your Dragon or, or Finding Dory like three weeks away. I think you got to move it at least a full month away from each other. Because both of these films have the potential to have pretty good legs going after that demographic. Right in the middle of a summer blockbuster season and you're capturing the young family demographic. <coughs> these are two films that could probably do pretty darn well. So not only do you not want to open them on the same day, you probably want to open them... A, a, a good amount of period of time apart. <coughs> Pardon me, guys. So, um, yeah, it's crazy that this flew completely under my radar, that we've got another game of chicken going on, but I believe they're going to move, and I believe this time around it's probably going to be How to Train Your Dragon 3. We'll probably move, not because they're scared of Finding Dory, but because I think, uh, like I said, I think DreamWorks and Disney are probably on the phone already. They're already negotiating and talking about what other movies do we have opening up, what release date do we currently have that you would like? And we'll give that date to you if you will move off this July 17th. These types of talks are probably going on now. And you just, <clears throat> you're not going to see them open on the same day. So don't worry about that. All right. Let's get to the next question. The next question today comes from Kevin Chico who writes, Hi AMC, my question is, uh, who's going to win an Oscar first? Joseph Gordon-Levitt or Tom Hardy? I think these two are upcoming movie stars and are two of my favorite actors. Your thoughts? Well, I'll be honest with you, uh, Kevin. I, I don't know that I would call either of them upcoming movie stars anymore. I think Tom Hardy <clears throat> and Joseph Gordon-Levitt are legit movie stars now. I mean, they're, they're, they're in the big leagues. They're not up and coming. They're not going to surprise everybody. Everybody knows Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Everybody knows Tom Hardy. And everybody's excited about what these guys are going to be involved in and uh, when they're going to be involved in it. <coughs> so, uh, I wouldn't call them upcoming. It's interesting that you're asking this question about which one will win an Oscar first. Because I, I think both of these guys have movies coming up that are a little bit Oscar bait movies. One is Tom Hardy. And no, I'm not talking about Mad Max. That's not going to win Tom Hardy an Oscar. But Tom Hardy is about to play Elton John in his biopic Rocket Man. Bane is playing Elton John. Um, that's an Oscar bait role, man. That is a role that will attract Oscar voters' attention. Tom Hardy playing Elton John. I'm excited to see him tackle this because Hardy is an excellent actor. At the same time, um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt has a movie that's already wrapped production, actually. It's called The Walk. We talked about it on AMC Movie Talk the other day. And it's based on the true story uh, the 1970s when <clears throat> um, the uh, the French dude, and his name's eluding me right now, uh, did a tight, wa uh, tight wire walk across a uh, wire between the two World Trade Center towers. And and the movie's called The Walk. And it's based on a true story. It's based on the novel of the true story. And uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's playing the lead in that. And that, I believe, is another Oscar bait role. So it's really interesting that you're asking about, you know, which of these two guys will win an Oscar first. It's conceivable each of them could win. I don't think their movies are going to be opening in the same year. But it's conceivable that each of them could win an Oscar for these next upcoming projects. So let's keep our eyes open for that and see where it goes. Um, overall, I, maybe... If I had to say one or the other, I'm going to say Joseph Gordon-Levitt will be the first one to win. But I, I think both of these guys... It's very impossible to say if someone's going to win an Oscar because like we talked about earlier, it's one of the most difficult things to do because not only can you be brilliant, but how brilliant someone else is going to be in another movie is outside of your control and they might be a little bit more brilliant. But <clears throat> I do think when you're talking about Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, you're talking about guys that 20 years from now, each of them will have multiple Academy Award nominations um, on their resume and probably one or two trophies sitting on their, their desks. All right. 
Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Jake Berlin, who writes, <clears throat> Hey, AMC crew, can't get enough of the show. Thank you so much, Jake. So yesterday, I'm roaming through my Instagram feed and saw your very own Christian Harloff post a picture of Chris Pratt in an Indiana Jones getup. Now, I instantly fell in love with the idea. It just never crossed my mind. With the talks of the indie franchise possibly doing the James Bond treatment, is there anyone out there who could fit the role better than Chris Pratt now that we saw his overall skills in Guardians? Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, Jake. Look, everybody knows how much I love Chris Pratt. I'm a huge Chris Pratt fan. I've had a chance to get together with Chris on a couple of occasions, and he's just a really cool dude. I've been a big fan of his uh, ever since I discovered Parks and Recreation. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures, actually. Chris um, came down and hung out with us at our AMC Movie Talk Studios at the Stream.TV for a couple hours one night when we did a, a Guardians of the Galaxy special hung, hanging out with me and Ann. Just a cool, cool dude. I'm a big fan of his. He was great in Guardians of the Galaxy. He's absolutely awesome. But <clears throat> now that I've told you about how biased I am for Chris Pratt because I really like him personally, I've had a chance to hang out with him a bit, I'll say this. One of the things that made his role, and I said this on Mailbag yesterday uh, over a different topic, but <clears throat> about Chris Pratt. One of the things that made Andy in uh, Parks and Recreation so great, and one of the things that makes Star-Lord in Guardians of the Galaxy so great, is the fact that both of those characters really kind of just are Chris Pratt. Now, remember I told the story that when I talked to Kevin Feige and James Gunn, um, and, and asked them, you know, why Chris Pratt for this role? And they said, because we wanted somebody who could bring their own personality and infuse themselves and their own personality into Star-Lord, much the way that Robert Downey Jr. did for Tony Stark, for Iron Man. And so with that being said, <clears throat> you know, Star-Lord, Peter Quill, is probably 70 or 80%. I used to say 60, but the more I see the movie, Star-Lord is probably more like 80% um, Chris Pratt. It's Chris Pratt being Chris Pratt. And when you look at um, a film like, or, or a TV show like Parks and Recreation, Andy is Chris Pratt being Chris Pratt. Now, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> Chris has also been pretty darn good when he's been playing different types of roles and supporting roles. He was, he was very good in Delivery Man with Vince Vaughn. Um, he, was, he was quite good in uh, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. <clears throat> So, I mean, it's not like he's just limited to being himself. But, you know, you ask in the question, you know, Guardian showed us Chris Pratt's overall skills. As much of a Chris Pratt fan as I am, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think we saw Chris Pratt's skills, really, because really Chris Pratt was just being Chris Pratt. And that's what they needed him to be, and that's what made the movie so awesome. But now you're asking, can he take over an iconic role that is not Chris Pratt? Because Indiana Jones is not Star-Lord. <clears throat> Indiana Jones is not the same guy, is not Andy uh, Dwyer from, from Parks and Rec. We already have an idea about who Indiana Jones is and how, what his personality is like and how he acts and how he behaves. And so the question becomes, can Chris Pratt do that? Can he act? By the way, he was also quite good in Zero Dark Thirty. It was a small role, but uh, he was pretty good in Zero Dark Thirty. <clears throat> Can he act? And look, as big of a fan and as biased as I am for Chris Pratt, I have to call like I see it. The answer is, honestly, we don't know. Um, we don't know yet. I think Jurassic Park is going to give us a lot of answers into a question like that. I think Jurassic Park, because in Jurassic Park, he's not Star-Lord. He's taking on a new character. I'm hoping that the character he plays in Jurassic Park isn't going to be just just Andy Dwyer again, isn't going to be just Chris Pratt again. I hope it's a character he has to play because if it is, you know, it'll be really interesting to see Pratt playing a different character that's not just an extension of himself and it's an action franchise and to see how well he can adapt to a different character in an action franchise. I think we'd have a much clearer answer to this Indiana Jones question that everybody's buzzing about after we see Jurassic Park. But I'm going to tell you right now, I... Because I haven't seen Chris do much more other than playing Chris, at least his best work so far has been Chris playing Chris, which is awfully entertaining, much like The Rock playing The Rock. Awfully entertaining. 
But until I see him do something more, and we just haven't had the opportunity to see him do more yet, but until I see him do something more, I'm not ready to stand up and say, yes, Chris Pratt should be Indiana Jones. Yeah, just because he looked good in a picture, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, so <clears throat> while I'm open to the idea and all that kind of stuff, I'm not ready to declare that Chris Pratt should be the next Indiana Jones. We simply just don't know yet. So, but I, for one, am really excited to find out, especially after the next Jurassic Park. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from George Davis, who writes, Hey guys, love the show. Well, thank you so much, George. My question is about movie bombs. What happens to the wages for all the people who worked on the film? Like, if an actor is working on a big budget movie and it horribly bombs, would their pay for the movie get cut down? Good question, George. This, um, <coughs> pardon me, this goes to an issue I've been talking about for a while. Um, the answer to your question is no. Um, when a movie bombs, wages for the people involved do not go down. When you sign on to do a job, you sign on for a certain wage and you do your job and you get paid. Whether the movie is a huge success or whether it terribly bombs and loses the studio hundreds of millions of dollars, doesn't matter. You signed on to do a job and you did your job, you get paid. <clears throat> now, and the only people who suffer financial loss are the people who finance the film. The bosses, if you will, and that's rightfully so. If you're the boss, you're the owner, you're the one who stands to benefit the most, then you're the one who suffers the losses, not the people you employ to do a job for you. And that's the way it should be. <clears throat> and most people agree with me on that, except for when I say, but the logic goes both ways. See, I've never been a big fan of um, this concept of percentages. Like, okay, this actor signed on to do this movie. He agreed to do the movie for $3 million. <coughs> and suddenly that movie becomes a big hit, makes $300 million worldwide. And some people will say, well, he deserves to get paid more than... And, and, and people off, or almost everybody disagrees with me about that because everybody loves their celebrities, so everybody disagrees with me on this. But to me, no. That actor agreed to do that movie for $3 million. If the movie had bust, is that actor going to give some of his paycheck back? No, he's not. He's going to keep his $3 million, and rightfully so. And I've always kind of believed that the same sh that logic could, should go both ways. And if the movie's a hit, then I don't think they should get any more. In as much as I think that the people who put up the money, the people who take the risk, the financial risk, in this case, the producers, the studio, whatever, the people who put up the money and pay for everything and take the financial risk, in as much as that I believe that if the movie bombs, they're the only ones who should suffer the financial losses because the risk was theirs. I also believe they're the ones who should enjoy the financial rewards if it's a big hit because, once again, the risk was theirs. <clears throat> and I, trust me, I have very good friends of mine who are far smarter than me, although that's not a big accomplishment, being far smarter than me. Uh, I, have, I have really good friends who are far smarter than me that will vehemently disagree with me on that. Uh, and argue with me and say, oh, no, if the actor's partially responsible for the success, they should get the... Well, then, if that's true, then why can't you say the actor's partially responsible for the failure and they should give some of their paycheck back? So, look, I'm going to acknowledge right up front, I am in the minority here. I am in the vast minority of my belief on this. Um, but it is my belief. And I believe if the logic flows that people like cameramen, set designers, actors, uh, writers... If they don't stand to lose money if the movie is a bomb, then I don't believe they should stand to gain money if the movie's a big hit. I, I believe the logic has to flow both ways. I don't think you can have your cake and eat it too. Where I agree to do this for $2 million, and if the movie bombs, I keep my $2 million, but if the movie's a hit, you gotta give me more. Like, I, I just don't believe in that kind of logic. So, that's just me, and once again, there are many good, valid arguments um, out there against my position. I acknowledge that right from there. There's some really good arguments out there. There's some good debate to be have, had on that issue. But, um, 
you know, it's been about seven years that I've been having this debate with friends of mine, and I haven't been persuaded otherwise yet. I still kind of believe that's the way it should be, but, you know, that's that's not the reality. And like I said, many smarter, smarter people than me have difference of opinion. But I think it's a good discussion. And I think anybody who's interested in the movie business, I think you would do well to hop online, start to read some of these debates, uh, get a little bit more informed about how the finances all work and stuff like that. Because you get a lot of, you know, some people I'm sure will want to write to me in the comment section, well, John, what about actors who agree to sign on for a movie for lower than their normal rate if they also get a percentage? You know, what, what if an actor who's worth $5 million a film agrees to do a movie for $1 million, but I get 2% of the box office gross? Um, I, I mean, so there, there's some gray areas there too, right? Like, because that, that sounds fair. Like, okay, I'm, I'm a producer. I only have to pay you $1 million, even though you're worth five, And I only have to pay you more if we uh, make money uh, and if we make more money. So there's a gray area there, right? So it's a great issue. It's a great debate. I, I encourage people to read up more on it and to form some opinions. And I'd be curious to hear your opinions, whether you, your opinions agree with mine or whether they disagree with mine. I'd like to hear your opinions in the comment section below. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Joe Jones, who writes, <clears throat> Hello, AMC crew. Love the show. Thank you so much, Joe. Due to Batman vs. Superman moving its date to March 25th, does that mean Batman vs. Superman won't get as much money now because it's not in the summer? Anyways, just wanted to know your answer. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Joe. It's an interesting question, one that's been going around for a bit. Let me just bring something up here. I believe Captain America 2... Um, I believe it opened April 2nd. Let me just pull this up here. Uh, April 4th. <clears throat> Captain America 2, The Winter Soldier, opened up on April 4th. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it made over $700 million worldwide, which is great for Captain America. It made $713.8 million worldwide on April 4th. So this March date, for Batman Super uh, Batman versus Superman is really only like one week earlier. It used to be that the summer movie star season started in June. Then the big blockbusters started coming out in May. <coughs> then we started seeing them come out in April. And then early April, Captain America Winter Soldier opened in on April 4th. Really it opened on April 3rd. And now we're getting into March. And you know, look, Captain America 3 opened and it made way more money than its first one than the first one did. It made over seven hundred million dollars at the worldwide box office, and uh, yeah, I think that kind of proves you can go a little bit earlier and still make the big bank. Batman versus Superman. Let's keep this in perspective. Is only one week sooner, just one week sooner than Captain America Two was. Um, so, do I think moving into March is going to hurt it? Honestly, I don't think so. I think there's some advantage to being the first blockbuster of the season to come out. Uh, I think, you know, everybody at that point, at least, you know, diehard movie fans like us, um, I think we're just waiting for the blockbuster seasons to start and we can't wait for the first one out of the gate. And the first big tentpole, huge milestone blockbuster film of the year is going to be Batman vs. Superman coming out March 26th. Um, so, no, <clears throat> I think it's a fair question to ask, or March 25th. I think it's a fair question to ask, but honestly, I think um, I think it's going to be okay. I think what is going to be interesting is to see how much further this trend goes. Because now 2016, we got the first summer film coming out in March, for heaven's sakes. Will the trend after 2016, once we get into 2017, will we see that trend getting earlier and earlier? Will we see mid-March? Will we see early March? Um, I mean, February is kind of considered the graveyard for box office movies, right? People just dump, they just, that's just where they dump their movies that they don't think are any good and probably won't do all the box office. Well, you suddenly now get a movie opening on March 7th. They're only like a week and a half removed from the graveyard of, of February. It, it'll be interesting to see if this trend goes any earlier. I don't think it will. Uh, well, let's put it this way. If Batman vs. Superman comes out on March 25th and does, you know, $100 million domestically opening weekend, makes $1.1 billion at the box office worldwide, then you're going to see studios starting to look at March a little bit uh, a little bit more serious. But all other things being equal, <clears throat> I 
I think um, I think March will probably be as early as it gets. Maybe it'll go as early as mid March, but um, but no, I think Batman versus Superman is going to be fine. I think it'll be okay. All right, let's move on to the last question today, and the last question today comes to us from Bradley Miller, who writes. <coughs> Hello, everyone at AMC Movie Talk. Thanks for the awesome show. Well, thank you for watching, Bradley. We appreciate it. I was wondering if you have ever thought of making an international movie show like AMC Movie Talk, one that helps inform more people on great international films. I remember my dad showing me a Bruce Lee film when I was younger. I was hooked. It helped me to learn about other crucial um, and the world, uh, about other cultural and the world I live in. I now have a great love and appreciation for foreign films. Your show has done a similar thing, informing me of informing me to epic new films and ways to look at them. Just thought the AMC family would do it justice. Thanks again for your time and keep up the astounding work. Well, thank you so much, Bradley. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I just thought of this now. Let me see if I can bring this up. Um, Twitchfilm.net. <clears throat> There's a website I highly recommend. Let me see if I can move it into to frame here. Um, there's a there's a website I highly recommend for uh, if you're a big fan of international film. The website is called Twitch Film, um, and Twitch Film is actually run by a guy named Todd Brown, who's very big, and he's actually one of the producers of The Raid and The Raid Two. And Todd Brown actually used to work with me on my old website, The Movie Blog, and then he spun off and started Twitch Film. And I'm telling you, when it comes to Asian and foreign film, um. He's just, Twitch Film is just the best site out there. Absolutely <clears throat> the best when it comes to this kind of stuff. And um, I highly, highly recommend it. Now, getting back to your main question about us at AMC doing international film. Well, I'm going to announce something here. And I don't know if Amy Rose might get mad at me for announcing this, but I'm going to announce it anyway. Um <clears throat> AMC Movie Talk, clearly, because the name AMC is in it, we, we focus on films that are going to be showing in AMC theaters. That's what we do. Um, and we generally just talk about the wide release films because otherwise, you know, if we talk a lot about films that are playing in four theaters or, or eight theaters in the country, then we're instantly alienating 95% of our audience because even if they wanted to see that movie, they can't because it's not playing in a theater near them. So for AMC Movie News, we generally speak about wide release films that everybody has the opportunity to see that are playing in AMC theaters. Makes sense, right? It's logical. However, <coughs> that doesn't mean that a number of us at AMC Movie News don't have a burning passion for independent and, and quite often foreign film. Now, AMC has this fantastic program that I am so proud of called AMC Independent or AMCI. <coughs> and what AMCI is, AMC Independent is, it's AMC has dedicated like 60 of our theaters uh, across the country. I, I could be off on the number by two or three, but I believe it's like 58, 60, something like that. We have 60 individual theaters that are dedicated to playing independent film. <clears throat> And kind of the, I think the tagline for AMCI at some point, it might not be the tagline anymore, but it was putting independent film where people go to see the movies. Because uh, quite often, if you want to see like um, really good independent, small, small independent film, you have to find an outhouse theater or something like that. And those are great. Um, but AMC decided to make a commitment to independent film to put them in bigger major theaters. And so we have like uh, like 60 screens across the country dedicated to playing independent film. And I'm super proud of that program. Um, now, it means that we get some films that, you know, play on 10 screens, some films that play on two screens, some films that play on 25 screens. I, I don't know. But <clears throat> what we have just decided to do in a few weeks, may, in as soon as two weeks, in as much as a month from now, um, it looks like we are launching a new show. And like I said, they're probably going to get mad at me for saying this because we haven't locked down the date yet. But I'm going to say it anyway. I'm the editor-in-chief, damn it. Um, uh, Amy Rose Eisenbach, our uh, Movie News Senior Editor here at AMC Movie News, she is headlining a show. She is, she is spearheading a new show called AMCI Indie Spotlight. It's going to be a weekly show here on AMC Movie News that just focuses on independent film. And, of course, a number of those independent films will also be foreign films, to be specific to your question. We've had a lot of foreign films 
play as a part of our AMC independent program. And uh, <clears throat> we are putting together a show. Amy Rose is spearheading it. She's working really hard on it right now, pulling it all together. We're going to have a weekly half hour show dedicated to highlighting the independent film that's going to be playing, including foreign films. They're going to be playing as a part of AMC independent. I'm really excited about this. Amy Rose is working so hard on it. She's doing a great job putting this thing together. Um, and uh, I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be great. So for those of you who are fans of foreign and independent film and want more of an inside look um, <clears throat> and be kept up to date on what's going on in the world of indie film, AMCI Indie Spotlight uh, is going to be a show for you. And uh, we're really excited about it. We can't wait to get this thing going. And I hope you guys give it a shot and check it out. Well, folks, that'll do it for me. I've run through all the questions today. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget, this is a great time. There's some absolutely amazing films playing in AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. And don't forget, once again, if you want a question on AMC Mailbag or AMC Movie Talk, take a chance and email us at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Email us anytime. As for me... You can find me on all the various social media networks, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. You can find me just at John Campia and follow me on all the various social media networks. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. Thanks for joining me again. And until next time, bye-bye.